Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Chris Meyer is joining me today on the show. And in this episode, we do talk a bit about what happens to the body when we die. So you might want to not have small ears present for today's episode. Chris is a lawyer, filmmaker, funeral home owner, and author of a new book, Life in 20 Lessons, What a Funeral Guy Discovered About Life from Death. This book is like This Is My Life meets Tuesdays with Maury. Meyer spent 14 years in the funeral business assisting grieving families, and in one case, the soon-to-be-departed, in planning funerals. It was a life chapter he never intended to write, but he feels grateful for the impact that this career detour has had on him personally. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank you all for your continuing support of the show and for passing forward my podcast. My podcast has grown only because of my listeners. So I just want to give you a moment to tell you how much I appreciate you and what you have done for me to help me grow. And I'm excited to say that I am now a featured creator on Fireside. Fireside is an app that allows the audience to be part of the process. So I will be hosting shows over on Fireside where you can listen live to the show. You can also ask questions of the guests. If you find me on Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. You can link to my fireside bio there and you'll be able to download the app through that. Also, if you haven't subscribed to my newsletter yet, please do so at dramyrobbins.com. I'm going to be switching to bi-weekly uh, newsletters, so you won't be getting them weekly anymore, but you will be getting bi-weekly newsletters with my soul wisdom and other fun tidbits that I'm going to bring to you all. So go ahead, follow me on Instagram, find me on Fireside. You will also still be able to hear your podcasts as you are used to listening to them on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. But Fireside gives you the opportunity to listen live with me. So I would love to have you come join me over there. DM me if you have any questions. And thanks again for your continued support. So tell us, I've never had a funeral home (laughs) owner, you corrected me, who was also the director at one point, but not anymore, on the show. So uh, what an interesting career choice. How did this come to be for you? Yeah, I don't know that it was so much a choice. As, uh, I, I didn't really have options. So I, I, I think just going back a little bit, I spent 11 years in Los Angeles trying to be a screenwriter after being a lawyer in uh, passing my bar and shooting a low-budget film in New York City. And then I told my parents, I'm not going to be a lawyer. And they were like, you are incredible. And uh, I loaded up my car and drove to LA and tried to be a writer. You know, did the whole thing, got a manager and an agent, slowly worked my way up, but never sold anything. And um, luckily met my wife there and we had our first son. And I think that for me was the the changing moment of, of growing up. And uh, once I saw him, his little eyes and his beautiful face, I knew I had to get something steady. And my wife was like, let's not raise a child in Los Angeles. And so the best option for me was a friend who had always been saying, Chris, Chris, the funeral business is safe and steady and always, you know, people the, are the always dying, I guess, right? Always dying, you know, and uh, lo and behold, we, we looked for about six months and uh, found a place that was teetering, had uh, some issues here, and we came in, swooped in, and and honestly, that's how I came to be. It was more about um, needing something for me and my family to get going in life, uh, and uh, I met up with a mortician who was a family friend, and he brought me into the business, so that was totally fortuitous, and uh, that's how I got in, so it wasn't a calling or anything, um, but uh 
it was more of necessity once I had a child and said, man, I, I got to get this going. You know, I got to I got to get our life going and, and provide for him. I'm not so sure that, that would have been my first like place I would have looked <laughs> if I was looking for job security. Well, it's true. It's a great it's a great question. But uh, I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer because I thought that would, you know, to you know, start on the rung and I would be working nonstop. And I really knew that I wanted to play a role in my son's life. And I always had this dad vibe, this something in me that always wanted to be, you know, the coach and stuff like that. I knew that. And my wife was the same. My wife was like, I want to be a mom. You know, I, I she was working in Westwood and, and providing for us. And that was a, a, a big turning, you know, was a, you know, you've, had, I'm sure we've all had those critical times when you talk husband and wife and you're like, okay, what's the plan? Where are we going? And uh, she had family up in these parts and that's where we headed. But uh, it was the best opportunity at the time, Dr. Amy and I, <laughs> I know that sounds frightening, but uh, it was, and it was a great, great uh, indoctrination into something that I knew nothing about. But when you have, in my mind, it really was no option. I, I had to grind and I knew that I needed to provide for my family and this was the best option. And it was a, yeah, it was, it was very, very enlightening to get in here for the first time. So what is the role of a funeral director? Like what you talked about the mortician. I'm curious what, what that's about. Um, but what did you do? Like, what's a job, your job description? Yeah, the job description for me, I was more of the the owner. I thought I I thought I was going to be the business guy, make sure that we you know kept overhead low, watch all the uh, make sure we hired the right people, but not realizing that you know there's this big dichotomy between a family owned place and a corporate place. We were a family owned place, and in a family owned place, you have to wear every hat, not many hats, every hat. So that is to say when they needed an extra person to go to someone's home to pick up a, someone who had passed, I was the extra guy. And you're, I so, you're, I you're so PC, someone who had passed. I'm like, he's going to say body, <laughs> the dead body. You're like someone who's passed. <laughs> we're, we're a little sensitive because of the industry we're in. Uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, so that would be me, you know, and I would go do that. That was my first, you know, go pick up someone with you know, the more, my mortician friend, the second, you know, was, Hey, can you go to the coroner's office? Which again, a whole nother experience. Then it was, you know, Hey, can you go in the embalming room? And, you know, can you see people in the embalming room? Sure. Again, I just felt like constantly in the back of my mind was my son. And that was truly, truly the greatest motivation because again, and I know we talked before the show about how, how, how in love with our children you and I both are, when for me looking at that little boy was all the motivation I needed. I, that was my grow up period. I had delayed growing up as far as humanly possible. You know, at that time I was what, 36, 37. And, you know, most men, you know, got it together a little bit earlier. So, um, for me, just being there with him was, look it, I got, I'll do anything. I was scrubbing toilets, you know, I would do anything. And I, I, I put my ego aside and I also, um, I could have no fear. And I, I tell the story in the book, which was one of probably the most poignant moments of walking into the embalming room with two bodies that were what they call posted, which they were totally splayed open. It looked like, you know, every CSI, you know, uh, episode you'd ever seen. And more so than just being like, oh, this is so gross. What, what hit struck me is that one was African-American and one was uh, Caucasian. And I was looking at them and they were both open. And for me, I don't know why my mind went there, but it was like, this is the everyone needs to see this they're, they're exact we're exactly the same inside mm. and we all you know for, i i don't know why i went to a race moment i probably because my movie was black is white is a, it was about race relations trauma but for me that was more poignant than seeing these bodies splayed open it was really about man i wish everyone could see this because look at the rib cage is exactly the same. The organs are the same. And I don't know why I went there on that moment, but that mm. was a very telling moment for me. And from there, once, once you've done that, 
it's it's all gravy if you can take that and the smells like i tell people just the unbelievable smells um then it's you know that's the stuff you protect the families from when they're coming in right and we we don't want them to see that that's our job our job mm -hmm. is to take care of that dirty work so that they can have the proper memory picture when the person is either in the casket or they're seeing them for the last time mm -hmm. wow i mean yeah. so how do you think for all these over the course i'm going to back up for a minute so you get the call you pick up the body you bring it to the funeral home correct and then what happens like the the refrigeration, refrigeration okay. is the most important thing the body remains in a cool place so that you slow down the decomposition of the body and then the threshold question which we generally ask in the home already is cremation or burial because if it's a burial they're probably going to want to see the body and you need to embalm the body if it's cremation then they could proceed right to the crematory and you have to follow the protocols that each county has in place to to get a death certificate the official document from each county that says yes you have the authority to cremate so really the the threshold question is do you want to bury and see the person or are we going to just we're going to cremate and head right down to court those so, are the two so the embalming process is i feel so ignorant is what like what do you do to embalm a body they, they, they drain the fluids from the veins and they pump them with embalming fluid which is generally tinted which gives the complexion done properly gives the complexion uh, 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 so it's not so pale and white, literally uh, gives you a, more of a rosy complexion so that the person appears to be, you know, the famous phrase is he looks like he's sleeping. He mm -hmm. looks so peaceful. That's what we're going for. Of course, there are so many complicating factors that people don't understand whether the people you know have hardening of the arteries, whether they haven't eaten properly, you know, all these things, how they died. Did they die and they fall in the toilet? And are they were they resting in a corner? And did their neck, you know, did someone not find them for, you know, 24 hours? All these things complicate how the body will be seen if if burial or if an embalming is chosen. So mm. yeah, there's so much that goes into it. And it's not, I mean, it is science, but it's, it's, it's the care of a body. Uh, what happened to that person and how did they live their life? I mean, that's the other thing, you know? Right. I mean, what a, what a um, sort of intense part of, of yeah. life, I guess. I mean, you're, you're with yeah. a body and it's really about like, how are you honoring right. that person in that moment? Even yeah, if their family not, isn't around and because they're not right. I mean, you take the body. So they're, yeah, they're generally not. Again, I tell some story of one time where we went into, I actually happened to, there was a, a, a long standing family in our community and they, they, you know, true. I like, and they had, you know, 10 kids and, you know, you go into these situations and that's kind of, Part of your role is to be this amateur psychologist because you're walking into this very intense place. You're exactly right. And there are so many different personalities and people are have been drinking and they haven't been drinking and they're not properly hydrated and they're overly tired because they've been sitting vigil for 24, 48, 72 hours, whatever it is. And at that moment, you suss up the personalities. Okay, who's the point person here? You know, they have a couple of sons. One guy is, you know totally distraught and other guys the type a gonna get one of these situations this guy i mean he was sussing me up even though i knew his sister his sister called me in because she knew me right but he didn't from adam so he was he was sussing me up and he asking me 20 questions to Sunday. and again you can't be offended you have to you know put on that your cheery voice and give him all the proper answers and he still you could tell he didn't buy it. He followed me 
back to the funeral home. He followed me into the, he said, can I come in? He came into the funeral home, watched me place mom in the refrigerator. I mean, he literally did everything. I said, of, of course, every step along the way, I'm like, of course, come on in. You know, I, what am I going to say? It's very unusual. I think it's probably maybe happened twice in my entire career, but of course you're going to let him. And then, you know, he's asking questions along the way. And, and it honestly, it's very nerve wracking, right? Because usually you do this by yourself, but this guy is watching over your shoulder and, uh, you know, watching you do everything. And um, finally, you know, I closed the refrigeration door and he just looked me in the eye and he's like, he's like, thank you. I, you know, mm. I really appreciate the care you took of my mother. And you know, that's, that's the gold star, right? That's the gold star as an adult where mm -hmm. you can actually, someone can just, who was questioning you an hour and a half earlier. And he had some, you could see, he didn't say anything more than that, but I could see the peace of mind in his chest, just like deflate, you know, and that felt, that felt good. It felt really good. So how do you, how do you psychologically or how have you <laughs> dealt with death. I mean, you're, you live, yeah. breathe death yeah. every single day. So how does that impact you it, psychologically? It's, it's a huge question. And I think, you know, I would go, I did a little research on, on funeral directors and I guess they have one of the highest alcoholism rates previously back in the day. And, um, I could see that, you know, you, <laughs> I, I always say, I said in the book, uh, you could either start drinking at 9.30 a.m. or you could have that personality that says, I'm going to go to every single one of my child's plays at school, practices. I'm going to coach them in everything. That I just felt that tipping point, and I was like, I, I'm, there's no way. I'm going to be involved in my children's life, and I have to disassociate at some point and just turn it off. But the, the hard part for me was, you know, certainly when children passed and, you know, going home, fucking my sons in that, that was the time, you, as you know, as a, as a parent, you know, when you decompress and you tuck your child in and they tell you about your day. And, and then my kids would have nearly asked me about my day. And, you know, I, I would mm. say, oh, it was, it was great, you know, and I'm so glad to be home now. And, and it's just here with you. But it, it was hard to not think about the child that's in my funeral home. But I think I just chose to just give more ex extra love and and just be more vested in, in that life. So psychologically, it is a massive burden. I don't think, you know, hospice is another one of those industries that you, you know better than anything. Those are angels on earth. I have nothing but the... I don't think enough people know about the hospice people and that they're volunteers is a totally a, another absurd thing. You talk about, you know, being a medium. I mean, they are there. They are the ones that are navigating this. And I just, I just don't feel like they get enough praise in this world mm -hmm. because I've just seen it. I've just seen it. They're just, they're just different human beings. They just, their compassion and empathy is at another degree from most humans. I, I utmost respect. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, like just walking someone to their death is, is a beautiful gift, but man. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> so, so in your mind, you know, I'm assuming you've attended thousands of funerals. Um, you've listened to thousands of eulogies. What makes someone's life stand out to you and what's impacted you the most? Like, is there one or two that you just want? Cause I want that life. The one that you remember, Yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> like what, what's the one or two that you walked away from saying that, like, that is the life that I want to have lived. Yeah. I think for me, it's always, it's always, and I, I learned this from my grandfather. I, I, I had a once in a lifetime relationship with my grandfather. He was my mother's father. He lost his wife way too early in life. And he was this German immigrant who had worked in New York city, delivering milk and cheese up and down the streets in an unair conditioned truck. He was 
sent bartered over from Germany in exchange for money. Um, I mean, just this great classic immigrant story. And um, he would always, always just say, you know, it's about family. It's always about family. And it's about those small moments. And I think we, we, we as a, a society tend to think, oh, these grand things. I want, I want this or I, you know, the big life. And for me, it's quite the opposite. Like I like the tiny moments and I like the people, the people's eulogies that I was inspired by were actually people who who didn't have these grand lives, who had very simple lives and who had massive connections with their family mm. and their children. And they didn't forget how to live in the present. We, I, again, I just feel like we're so much, how do I, where am I going to be in five years? Where am I? The, the simple eye connection that we have with a family member to me is the greatest. And I've heard those eulogies talking about, one great eulogy was a woman and I, it was the end of the day, I was tired. She was clearly distraught. Her husband had died. It, you could tell that they were best friends and she was holding something back. And I was like, you know, is, what do you, I know you got something in, cause I, I'm, I'm feeling this vibe. And I was like, and she was just studying me, like intensely looking at my eyes. It was almost like I had known her or she was trying to recognize, do I know somewhere? And I said, what's going on? And she's like, I, I have something to tell you. And I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And she's like, my, my, my husband was a clown. And I said, yeah, my wife thinks I'm a clown too. And you know, well, well, that's awesome. I mean, I think that's a cool way to live. And she's like, no, no, he was literally a clown. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, everyone knew him as a clown. She's like, can I bury him in a casket in his clown outfit? And I was like, oh. absolutely, absolutely. And that was one of the best uh, funerals because clearly that entire audience, that was who he was, right, to them. Mm. They remember him as a human, obviously, but he, they knew how much he loved it. And I, you know, we all tend to think, oh my God, clowns are so creepy. You know, I got the mustard stain at the children's party from the, you know, but this guy was like legit, you know, he was like back in the old school day and you could tell he would just break it out at a party once in a while, but everyone knew him as that. And when they would walk, they were walking down the aisle of the chapel to the casket, there were audible laughs in the audience. You know, you could see like, mm. oh my God, there he is, you know? And so things like that impact this. They're smaller moments, though. You know, it's just a, a life well lived to me is 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 someone cognizant of those moments of the, the moments of eye connection, the moments of being there for your child or your parents, especially as they age. You know, aging isn't always pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, Art Linkletter back in the day said that or someone, you know, it's not always pretty. But that sort of to have that empathy and compassion to realize, hey, there with the grace of God go I, right? I mean, I'm going to be there soon. You're going <laughs> to be there soon. We're all going to be there. Hopefully not so soon. Happy. Hopefully not soon. But at yeah, some point. <laughs> right. But also, you know, it's important to teach your children that the respect of the elders and being around elders. And I think they, you know, they learn so much from that. I know I did as a child. My mother it was crazy about her father. And I saw that and that kind of inspired me to be even mm. more crazy about him. So yeah, it's always the smaller moments, Dr. Amy. I, I, it, that's, that's it for me. What about if someone just sucked as a person? Like what does their <laughs> funeral look like? Yeah, there, there is that. You definitely get <laughs> <laughs> um, like how do you know like well, no one shows yeah. up or like what they say anyway in this one there was guns drawn there were I, you know again we're in suburban sacramento and we had to call the police because there were actually guns drawn and i was like this is out of control get the get the police here and there's ex-wives fighting with wives and I was like, no, 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 stop, stop. So yeah, you do, <laughs> you're, it's a dead giveaway. Um, but what about like, they, they were just know, like selfish or like, okay. yeah. 
Like what if I they think were just... they tend not to memorialize those people. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the key in that you don't usually hear a eulogy for someone that's. Uh, I thought the the gun thing was as unique as I've seen. Yeah. Wow. Um, so let's talk about a few lessons that you discuss in the book. And I I chose some ones that I think are sort of more related to what it is about being in a physical body. Um, but you said uh, make a few good make a few good friends was one. So yeah. can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I I think again, it's just we you know, when you're younger, you're always like, oh, I want to be in this clique or that clique and have all these people around. And I think the uniqueness is having a couple of good relationships. And I'm blessed because I have a, a, a great friend of mine from law school whom we talk literally five days a week. And it's mm. insane. But I can tell you that we always say that we function as each other's psychologist because it's so great, especially as a man, to have this relationship. And I think you need, you need some relationships outside of your family, but I don't think it's very many. And I think we tend to start to think, oh, I need all these friends. The less friends that you have is, is good, but have the relationship with them. Have that outside relationship where you connect on a different level or you could pick up the phone and you, you know that there's just no judgment. He's a guy that I can talk to about, you know, whether it be my wife or finances or business, any of that, that for me is such a great sounding board. And, and I find tremendous solace in that. But again, I, I don't need, I, I need less, not more. Mm -hmm. So um, enjoy food. That was an interesting choice. I love food. <laughs> I, I love everything about it. Yeah. I I think food for me is passion. Like uh, I, you know, we have those, the great books, Eat, Pray, Love, and all these, you know, women traveling to great ports of call and cooking or these cooking shows. But I think you learn a lot about people. You know, I, I tell a story about Anthony Bourdain. For me, he was a rock star. He would, he would celebrate food and it wasn't this highfalutin food all the time. There was a lot of street food and stuff like that. But he knew when you sat down and broke bread with someone, you could solve a lot of the world's problems, right? Because mm. it becomes, it sort of, it makes us all common and it makes us all in, we're, we're happy when we're eating a lot of us. And I don't know, I, I never understood. Oh yeah. I, I want to look at, we all want to be a little thinner for sure, but there's something glorious about whether it's a, an in and out double, double cheeseburger, or, you know, it's, it's a fine steak or whatever, a, a nice piece of fish, whatever you enjoy. But food for me is life. I, I just, I like preparing it. I like eating it. Great part. How about you? Are you are you a foodie or no? I I do enjoy. I love to cook, so I have a harder time these days. Well, especially now since we're still pretty somewhat locked down. Um, finding places where it tastes is, and I'm not a like spectacular cook, but tastes the way that I know. Yeah, yeah. that I like food to taste because I like food to taste like it's meant to taste like right. for whatever it is, not right. like over salted. But I think the point that you raise that's really interesting is that it's it's what happens when you're eating, right? Like one of the one of the biggest um, sort of uh, psychologically, the, the biggest sort of proponents in terms of like your child's, I don't want to say success, but like their mental wellness and things along those lines is always like, can you sit down and have dinner as a family? That is a big oh, um, outcome huge. for, because you, you're spending that time connecting and wow. you're talking about your day and there's hopefully, you know, devices are set aside. And it's really a time, unfortunately in my house, it's become like we sit down, we eat, we, we get up from the table and we go back to our friends. Right, right, but, right. but in those moments, you really do have these small, beautiful experiences of connecting. And that, that's, sort of what you're saying is that that's what food is about. It's about, 
And I think that's what I've missed certainly most. One of the things I've missed most during this time is being able to go out with friends and just sit around a table and have a drink or have some appetizers and and yeah. connect or dinner or whatever it is. Yeah, it's huge. I agree with you. It's a, it's a huge missing point, especially as adults, right? I mean, we're so much with our children, but to have that time just to kind of decompress. I went out last week with uh, a bunch of guys and it was the first time and I don't know, it just felt different. It was just like, ah, just to me, just to talk to other guys about, you know, nothing, the NCAA tournament or nothing, mm-hmm. in, nothing in particular. Uh, my wife said that she's like, well, was it fun? What'd you do? And I was like, we just sat there and had a drink right. and it was wonderful. It was outside and we were all kind of smiling and Nothing too much was said, but it was just nice to to have that. You're right, that 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 connection. So okay, so the next one, stop worrying about money. Yeah, I mean, it's that's hard, right? That's just that's just hard. It's just a difficult concept, and I think you know, I think it all turns out okay. You know, I, I really do. I think you have to step off the habit trail of life. I think it's a lot less complicated than we make it seem. I think the media plays a huge important, not, it's not important. It's a massive role in our life, especially with these devices and, and children on them. I mean, I think the funny thing that I notice out here, you know, being near Silicon Valley is all these tech guys (laughs) don't allow their children to be Mm -hmm. on tech. And I think that's a very ironic thing. I don't Mm -hmm. think a lot of people hear about that, but it's like they know what is behind, you know, getting eyeballs on these devices. And it is all about eyeballs. And um, whether it's finances or, or tech, I think simpler is better. And going back to a way that it used to be of playing, uh, you know, that individual play. I see my son with figurines and it's just, it's so phenomenal to A, see him using his imagination, but B, have you ever listened to a child who is just self-playing? It is so unique and it is a wonderful family moment or, or parental moment. My wife and I sit there and we're like, hear him in the other room and it's just so fun and so joyous to hear him having those just quiet moments away Mm -hmm. from a device Uh, and and the last one is dest do epic if you child are listening turn it down for a second (laughs) shit today do epic shit today yeah so that's i don't like hearing no in anything in, that I do. And I think, you know, the classic thing is, you know, we're maybe what, we're graduated from college and we're at Thanksgiving dinner and you're talking to an uncle and he's like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And you're like, I don't know, I'd like to be, uh, you know, I'd like to colonize Mars. And he looks at you and goes, yeah, maybe you should be an accountant, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and I just don't like to hear no. And I think anything is possible because we're seeing people every day, right? We see people make movies. We see people make rocket ships. We see, like, to me, it's why not me? Why couldn't I do that, right? And there's a famous football player, Russell Wilson, who said his dad used to say that to him, why not you? Why can't you be one of that person? If we can instill that in a child, to me, that is the greatest thing. You know, Dr. Amy, we talk about failure, right? Oh, we, I, at least in my generation, I was conditioned failure. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. I'm telling my children to fail, right? I want you to fail. I want you to fail every day of your life because that is your building brick. And I'm not saying if you fail and do the same thing, that's insanity, right? We all know that that's the definition of insanity. But if you fail and you build on that failure, that's your basic brick. And by the time you get to be where you have to take care of yourself, you're gonna have a a great foundation and a great house because you're gonna have learned from those experiences and you're not have gonna, you're not have gonna been fearful. So that's the whole idea behind DEST. It's do epic shit, think I can do it, right? And I want my children to live like that. It's hard, don't get me wrong. It's hard with Xbox and 
this life avatars and I mean it's insane I went and played it I couldn't even use the controllers it was it was so insane but the the visual I don't know how you get a child away from that that's insane the way it, what they see versus what we saw I mean I played the game pong you know right, right. Pong, pong, right. Pong, that was that pong was and Tetris not to right. date ourselves pong and Tetris so have you ever, last question, have you ever had any interesting metaphysical experiences happen while you- I just got asked this the other day on a podcast and I, I really, here is the, the, everyone thinks because you're in a funeral home, you see like things moving or something like that. I have not. I have definitively not seen that. The, the most metaphysical that I have had has been an experience for myself with my grandfather. And again, I think what he loved was the outdoors and walking in the outdoors and he was exercised. And so when I would walk pretty regularly in the morning, like super early, I would feel a presence. Like I would feel him. I don't know if it was just because I was more prone to wanting to feel him, but I feel him on this earth still with me. Like mm. I, I talked to, <laughs> I know that's strange, but I do. I, I mean, this is what him. my show is about. So it's yeah. not at all strange to I me. Do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I really, but for me, I think that is commensurate with the love that I felt for him. And I think that's all for, I try to explain that to a lot of people in death and dying you know, there's Kubler Ross who wrote the le legendary book, but I think it, if it, your pain is commensurate with the amount that you love that person. Mm. And I, I always say the cruel thing about death is that, you know what, the next morning, there's still a freaking line at Starbucks and there's right. still traffic, right? But the world goes on, but your world is in this, you know, chasm. At least for a year, maybe longer. Yeah, for many more. longer, right? Maybe longer, and um, I just find, uh, for me, it had to transition from the pain to the honor, and saying, mm. "Look, he's not gone. He's still with me, and I have to. I have to, just because again, we were best friends, and I needed that, and so yeah, I feel him a lot. Mm -hmm. Do you feel uh, metaphysical? Oh my God, all the time. Really? Yeah. Go listen to all my episodes. You'll he you'll hear lots of my stories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's very, yeah, it's very present for me. That's why I was just curious if people if if you've ever had in the home in the funeral home, like, you know, things that have happened that have made you say, Huh, that's interesting. Like that wasn't there or that light keeps flickering or but no. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. No, I want to, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it is, it, it's for me, it's the total, I do feel that with my grandfather for sure. For sure. I want to yeah. feel that with my parents. If you know, God, when they <laughs> pass, they're healthy, thankfully, but uh, I want that because I want to believe that there's something beyond here. Right. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I really, that's the way I want to live life. Yeah. And I don't know how, you know, I've talked to my dad and he said, no, it's done when I'm done. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to think that. I, I can't do that. Yeah. I but, think, you know, there's certainly, it's something to explore and to be open to. So Chris, thank you so much for your time today. If people are interested your book in your book, where can they find it? Where can they find they you? They can find it Amazon, Google, uh, any audio book store for sure. Uh, Definitely. I would love you to read it. It's a, uh, it's a light, easy, fun read. And the book is called life in 20 lessons. What a funeral guy discovered about life from death. So thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Like what you heard today and want to hear more wondering what comes next and what it all means. Head over to Apple podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between. <laughs>